start for the summer, we're going to start a new song. The choir is in the back in our uh, loft. That's our loft now back there. Um, so they're going to help lead this. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we hear them sing it once, and then you all can join in. You may have heard this song before, but just so we're all on the same page, let's hear the, the great singers and then, the, then the, those of us who like to sing. Okay, let's try it. That happened with Pat once, but she was walking. Okay, well, Paula's going to lead us in the call to worship, and we can get this thing started. Good morning, everyone. Please stand if you're able and join me in the call of worship. In spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. I simply cannot build up my hopes on the foundation consisting of confusion, misery, and death. I can feel the suffering of millions. And yet, if I come to heaven, I think that it will all come right, that this cruelty will end and that the peace and the tranquility will return again.
peace of Christ with those who are watching online today. And now with all your neighbors in the sanctuary. This morning's scripture is from Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. Now Paul had spent a few years in Ephesus, and a decade or two later, one of his followers wrote back to that church to help remind them of some of the central ways of living in a community and offer some advice on particular conversations or controversies. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you all to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and kind. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one 
glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, God has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Now these are the gifts Christ has given to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the in, in, yeah, in, <laughs> you know what I mean, <laughs> and pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work of building up the church as the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies, so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Amen. Amen. Right. The kiddos are going to come forward, so I might just come out this way. Uh, what's your name? What is Mac. Max. Do you like puzzles, Max? Like what type of puzzles? Okay, who here likes puzzles that are 15 pieces? <laughs> who likes 10,000 piece puzzles? Those are pretty hard, aren't they? So in a puzzle, you have some that are corner pieces, and you have some that are all kinds of wiggle pieces, right? That's how puzzles work, and they have 15. If all the puzzle pieces were corner pieces, wouldn't work. Yeah, what happens when you're missing a piece? You finish it up and there's like one piece missing. You could try to find it under the couch. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be, that's, that's what my house is like. Uh, but it's, oh gosh, there's, you, you want all those pieces in all the right places. What happens when you take a piece that's kind of shaped like this and you have a hole that's kind of shaped like this and you try to squeeze it in there? Does it work? No, it doesn't work. Of course not. Max says no. Um, God thinks that people are like puzzles. And that when we're missing one, we should go find it. We should look at it. We should go find the right person to be part of the whole group. And God thinks that people in life are like puzzles because sometimes some of us are corner pieces. I'm pretty organized. And some of us have really, really rounded edges. Some of you out there have really worn down some edges. <laughs> and sometimes all, you need all kinds of people to put a puzzle together. In the church, it's great that some people are young like you and some people are older and some people are in the middle. Churches are great when they have people who are men and women and some in between. People are great when, churches are great when they have some who think this over here and some who think this over here and some who have lots of questions. Some churches, we have people who can sing really loud. <laughs> and we have people who can pray really quiet. And it's so good when we can be a puzzle that all fits together. Okay, so Max, the way we do this here is I say a few words and then you and everyone gets to repeat them. So dear God, Thank you for differences. Thank you for differences. Help, me to accept Help me to accept and to celebrate, and to celebrate everyone. everyone. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if, if Max or Henry or if anyone just gets bored with me, um, Olya and Laura are going to take out some kids to play some games, maybe some puzzles. I don't know, do some drawing, some coloring, all the way, way fun.
Okay, most of you know that I was gone for a while in Turkey, and when, when we, we were figuring out how to make that work, the session had this idea. They said, hey, a, a, a lot of the early church happened around there. Why don't you use some of your continuing education to, to learn about the, the earliest church? And when they said, I jumped on that idea, and I knew exactly where I wanted to go. Because in seminary, a long time ago, I had taken a class on the archaeology of the New Testament. Uh, sadly, we did not fly anywhere to, to, to dig anything up, but we learned a lot about, not what, not what the Bible says about the cities or the cultures or the context or the people. What we did is we looked at the research, the real deep historical research, and then we, like, what does that say about the Bible? What does that say about the world that the Bible landed in? And regardless of what, you, whatever you think about God or Jesus or heaven or any of that, what is the, the ar, what do the archaeologists tell us about how to understand the beginnings of this faith that we claim? And what are those roots, secular and sacred, what do they tell us about trying to live holy now in the midst of our own, you know, stress and mundane lives and just trying to make it through our own context? Our professor, his name was Hel Dr. Helmut Kester. He was this German guy who was so old and he knew so many details about every city that you had to wonder if he was just 2,000 years old and he had been <laughs> walking around. Uh, he most got my attention. He, he grabbed my attention. You know, when you have a professor, it takes a while to connect. He grabbed my attention when he talked about a gravestone. They had gravestones then. A gravestone of a random sailor. No one really knows his name. He's not important. But his gravestone said that he had sailed the southern coast of Greece uh, 86 times. 86 times. I wasn't impressed at all. There's no reason you should be impressed at all. 86 times around a coast. Big deal, right? Well, um, what was amazing is that the southern coast of Greece has terrible wind and lots and lots of little islands that are hiding under the water, so it's treacherous. If you tried to sail there three times, you'd have at least one shipwreck. Guarantee it. So this guy is, is Paul had three shipwrecks over his time, right? So uh, let's, let's, take a, uh, let's look at the map of, of Corinth there. See, so, so this is, there's the southern coast right there. So um, instead of the southern coast, what people would do, because that was so dangerous, is they'd go to that tiny little bit there in the middle. This, uh, this gravestone helped, you can keep that up for a bit. This tiny little gravestone helped us understand why people felt, instead of going and being dangerous, they could go to where that arrow points, the little narrow part, that's where Corinth is, and if you were a sailor, you'd, you'd come in, you'd have longshoremen take all the junk off your boat, and then people would carry it across to the other side, and they'd put it on a different boat, and they'd take off the other side. It was a little more time, but it was a lot more safe there, okay? Uh, everyone did this, except for a few outliers, like this crazy guy with a, a tombstone. Okay, so you can take that off there. Um, so to understand Corinth, the city and the, the letter to the Corinthians, some of you read Corinthians at your wedding. To understand the whole context of that, it helps to understand their economy, their culture. Because when you realize, so, so if, you, if you're doing this with sailors, there's sailors from all over the world in the same city. They're diverse as can be. People believed all kinds of different religions. They had all kinds of, of life. The, Corinth had no problem with people of different races or people of different religions. Although being a sailor's town, it was full of rowdy drunkenness and all the associated things that come into there. If you were in the Navy, I'm sorry, it's just the truth is the truth. Like sailors were partying because they're stuck on a boat for so long with each other, so when they get off, they want to party. And that's a little insight. So, so if you go to Corinth, you're going to see some ancient ruins up on a hill in, in, in the suburb, Acro Corinth, right? Uh, and the evangelical scholars who, who have their image of the Bible and then they, they layer that onto history, they are certain, they are absolutely certain that temple, that if you go in there, there's lots of these images of women like sketched into the walls. They're certain that those women, let's see that picture. Let's see where that temple is. So you, you, it's, it's up the hill. It's not up the big hill, but it's up the hill. They are certain that, the, that those women could not be priests in a temple because no women could ever have leadership, and therefore no women should have leadership. Praise God to the patriarchy. Amen? No, no. <laughs> but those evangelical scholars, they thought those women, they must have been waitresses because that's a good job for women back then. And, they, and those, those images had the women serving grapes and pomegranates. Uh, and so they assumed that the sailors who had one day off while their goods were being taken over, they assumed that those sailors would hike all the way to the suburb up the mountain so they could go to the temple and pray. 
Yeah, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. So Helmut Kester also, same reaction as you. He would, he would like zoom into these, the pictures of the women and the pomegranates and the grapes, and he would talk about like the cultural associations around pomegranates and grapes, and he would point out like it was a brothel. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says, duh. Yeah, <laughs> it was a brothel. That's where the sailors would, would go out of town. The most famous and obvious building in the whole town it was of ill repute. It tells us something about why this letter to Corinthians has kind of a lot of details about sex. And maybe it's up to you to make the next connection, but th those details in Corinthians, they could be just relevant to that community that struggled with that issue, right? Or they might be, the principles underlying them might have uh, something to do with us. And so given that context, we might understand that God's inspiration in the Bible more and how that speaks to LGBTQ rights or women's bodily autonomy or what counts as pornography or the importance of fidelity. All this unfolds from one silly gravestone, right? This, and that's why Helmut Kester grabbed my attention is he told this story from one piece of history and it, 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 it showed up into today's life. And that's one fun example um, from a place I did not go. Okay, so you can take that one off. Um, but all through seminary, that, this class, I was so excited to go to Ephesus. Someday, someday I wanted to go to Ephesus because all the stories were about a, what a technological marvel this city was. It, it was ahead of its time in so many ways. Imagine, if you will, and I'm sure you've all imagined this, what if some computer whiz could organize all the red lights in town so that it minimized red lights and somehow some computer algorithm could make it so that we all were super efficient about getting around Salt Lake? Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, that's what we want. And now imagine, now what would that do if this was a technological marvel? Imagine how much less stress you would have. Well, how much stress I would have. Grr! How much more patience you would have for your neighbor how you could show up at appointments with more peace and more calm. Imagine how you would treat people differently when you showed up that way. Imagine how the whole society of our town could change and what problems we could put energy into, how the spirit could flourish in this town with one technological marvel. Now for Ephesus, they didn't, they didn't have smart lights back then, but hundreds of years before Paul was there, he was there in the 50s, not the 1950s, just the 50s. Uh, he was there, but hundreds of years before that, Ephesus was actually down the road. And um, the river kind of silted up and it became a swamp and a lot of mosquitoes and all that stuff happened. So they had to move it. And over hundreds of years, they, they moved it. They knew they had clean water. And so over time, they invested all the most brilliant minds in a, in a great water system. It might not have been the best in the whole world, but given the hills they have and where the bad water was, it was the most advanced water system in the whole world. If you go to Ephesus today, right when you go through the turnstile, they're gonna show you the beginning of that water system, which is a, sh a, a bath. Everyone who came in had to take a bath. Just like when you go to the pool and you're supposed to take a shower before you get in, everyone in Ephesus had to take a little bath. And then this amazing sewer system of, of that clean water, it would go down, it'd go to the brothel, that's the last time we're gonna use that word in this, uh, in this sermon, and then it would go down to the public toilets, and then it would go under and like go out as clean as any city uh, ever in that, in that time frame. And you wonder, what would that do in an ancient world where everyone is just used to being kind of dirty and you're used to you know, poop in the streets, this was the cleanest city in the entire world. How, how would you interact with your neighbor differently if you had entered that city? Would you trust him more? Would you be more connected? Would you give people the benefit of the doubt? As you walk down this, this, uh, this main avenue from the, from after taking the bath, you come to a government building on the right. It was, a, it was a sm much smaller than this building, but it, it might have held 30 or 40 people to, to have conversation. It had central heat and air. Okay, they built the walls in a way so that it would flow central heat and air, which is the first time in history that happened. If you go for all the way to the end, they have an amphitheater where when we walked in, our guide would snap. Do you, do you hear that? Not much. He would do that in 14,000 seat arena. It would echo, echo, echo. One snap of the finger. They could figure out uh, acoustics and central heat and air. I gotta say, once a year, our, our heater breaks in this building. And half of you can't hear what I say unless you're reading it up there. So 2,000 years ago, they were more advanced than, than, than really we were in, in some ways. 
And what does it mean that they wanted an auditorium where everyone could hear and to be comfortable? It meant that they wanted everyone involved. They, they appreciated that people could hear and make their own opinions. About 50 years after this letter was written, the most famous thing that you've seen of Ephesus is this beautiful library. Well, that was written 50 years after it. Third biggest library in the world at the time, and the city wasn't even the hundredth largest city in the world. You know, what does that say about a town that invests its resources in something like a library or an auditorium or a museum or for their kids? So what does it mean about the world that Paul landed in in the 50s? It meant that some people who designed all this were highly skilled and highly educated, and they valued that education as a city. They valued the expertise. They probably valued how advanced they were compared to all those other hayseed towns on the inland. There are great things about cultivated people, uh, but... I have met a lot of people who are really highly educated and really highly skilled. Uh, I've mingled with really highly educated people my whole life. I tried to be really highly educated for a long part of my life. You know what I found um, with people who are that cosmopolitan? They are not known for their humility or their deference. When you do meet someone who's, who's just so amazing and they have that, it's, it's like you appreciate them even more. So I want you to imagine, like, let's, Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd is just the kindest human being in the world, right? But he's also a great actor and all this. Or Princess Diana, who's just so graceful, but you think of her in other ways. Imagine these first century Paul Rudds and Princess Dianas. They might have been in Ephesus, but more likely we had first century Elon Musks. Okay? (laughs) People who thought they were great engineers or who could pay for great engineers, really, uh, and, and they thought probably, well, since I'm such a great engineer, I should probably be a leader of the church, too. Now, I should probably be the mayor of the town, too, as well. And it's just a conjecture, but the most, in the most advanced technical city in the world at the time, with the most advanced technical people at the time, sitting next to people like you and I, how do you think that went? How do you think they got along? Would some have been prideful? Would some have felt less meaningful? Would anyone have layered on their sense of this hierarchy with an idea of how God created us to be? And not that class consciousness has gone away at all, but if we can expect that there was some tension in that place, what might Paul and his friends have written to the church about? How would Paul's followers have cautioned against what happens when we fall into that trap thinking, I'm better than you? And maybe Paul's friends are speaking right to that issue when it says each of us have a special gift and it has nothing to do with our work and everything to do with how God works through us. As general as that principle might feel, imagine what it would do in that context with the potential, we don't know for sure, but the potential for so much tension and conflict in a community. Or very similar, but more to the point. What did it mean when you're walking down from past those government buildings, eventually you get to the, the, like the Rodeo Drive of Ephesus, and the shops that are right on that main street have the most, or this is nothing to do with the Bible, has the most ornate mosaics in the world in ancient times other than temples and palaces. Other, other than those sacred places, special places, it's as pretty as it gets. They're so pretty that you can't afford them. You couldn't afford them today if it was in your house. If you could afford mosaics like that in your house, we have some talking to do at stewardship time. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they're, they're beautiful, and, it, and it, it shows that really fancy people not only lived there, but shopped there. Uh, one king retired to Ephesus. Mark Antony and Cleopatra, you remember them? They honeymooned there. Okay? They, those people wanted to shop somewhere, and this is where they would shop. So other than class... Does income inequality ever cause tension in a community? Or or think of it this way. Who's the wealthiest person to ever sit at your kitchen table? Who's the poorest person to ever sit at your kitchen table? Why is it so hard for rich folk and poor folk to to mingle and be friends? I I don't know how that played out in Ephesus with an early church where Jesus was was friends with, with people like Joseph of Arimathea who could afford a, a grave on the spot and with beggars on the street. But, but, those, but those shops and the, the homes behind the shops were even more ornate. We can go and measure every, every city they've uncovered from 
China to, to Mesoamerica. We can uncover those homes and measure their kitchens. We can measure their ovens. And what we know is that Ephesus had bigger kitchens and bigger ovens than any city for centuries in the time. Huge houses. In a church, this is before anyone ever invented a sanctuary like this. So the early Christian community met in homes. If the early Christian community met in my home, I can fit six people around my table. If I fit eight people around my table, you're sitting on outside chairs, so it's fine, but it's outside chairs. Uh, at the band party, when we, when we do have the band, whenever that's happening, how many people are around that table? 20, 25? Different feel, right? Different ways of communicating when there's a table of six and a table of 25. Uh, what would it mean for that community, for Christian worship itself, to have that many people with different conversations, sharing and, and drinking wine together and just, just singing? And, and church was just bigger in Ephesus with more people and more chaos than any of the other cities where it originally developed which is great because church is supposed to be beautiful and beloved and it's supposed to rise above economic differences. But size presents more opportunity for conflict. And what do you think, after the 25-person table, what do you think happened when it went over to Billy Bob's house who just has a one-room shack dug out, of the, dug out of the ground? Did everyone go or was there some division? Or what happens when it's, Billy Bob's turn is done and now it's... Uh, you know, Bezos, Walton, McGates III, it's his turn to serve dinner, but Bezos, Walton, McGates III, he serves cheap food. He goes to Taco Bell, goes to McDonald's, <laughs> brings it in. How, think of the tensions that could arise there. And we know in other books that there were tensions in these communities when the rich folks served cheap wine and the poor folks just lavished their guests with a feast. Does that cause shame? Does that bring uh, people to be uh, closer in some ways when people are open? What happens with bitterness and self-centeredness in these communities? And my point is just based on like, the, the idea of the real history here and thinking through what that means. Their tensions were real, lived tensions. I'm sure they argued about theological mumbo-jumbo that the historians write about forever. But in their real life, what they grumbled about was elbow room at the table. And they grumbled about who's being kind to who. They had to earn their sense of being one body with one spirit and one hope in one Lord. And they had to be reminded, which is why Paul's followers wrote this letter. And speaking of one Lord, when you pass those fancy shops, the first public space you come to, the first big open space down this nice, beautiful row, you, there, it's a, um, on one side, there's a, a, a picture of the image of why this city was called this city. In Salt Lake, we have our legends about, you know, Emigration Canyon, this is the place, all that stuff. They have that in a, on one side, and it says, it was named after the Hittite word apasos, Ephesus apasos, which is, sort of means afterthought. And the legend is, is this, this Greek guy was traveling, looking for a place to found a city. He got drunk, he fell off his horse, and he said, oh yeah, this is where I'm supposed to find this, to do the city. And so they made a, an image of that, which is not an honorable way to remember your town name. <laughs> but on the other side, if you look over here, there's another image of, um, of uh, the other idea of how Ephesus was founded, and it is named for Ephos. Ephos was the queen of the Amazon women in the legend of the Amazonian uh, women there. And it seems likely to me that this is the more realistic, Ephos is the more realistic idea because just down the road is the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. Artemis was a, a, a female divinity that was a little bit mixed in that place between the local goddesses and this Greek goddess. Uh, and then when you walk 10 more steps past this Ephos, you see the statue of Nike. Uh, Nike is the goddess of victory where we get the company name Nike, right, that's where that comes from. And there's this beautiful statue of her right there, pretty, pretty well preserved, and the guide says, uh, do you want a picture with Nike? And I say, sure, I'd love a picture with Nike. He says, just do it. <laughs> yeah, that's not my joke. Yeah, yeah, I had the same reaction, but I went and took that picture. So my point is, uh, there's two sides of this. One, this town of, of, of Ephesus is really familiar with religious traditions all mixed up and appreciating that about different people. And it's also really familiar with the idea of feminine, divine power. What does that mean for the early church, for the world that Paul entered into? 
How might Paul have dealt with these questions of religious ideas mingling together? How might he have addressed gender roles in the most progressive city in the ancient world? Well, first of all, he would probably emphasize, he would probably try to place God as some sense of, of encompassing all of their hopes and dreams about a better life. He would probably say something about one Lord, one baptism, one hope. We're all in this together, even if we come from different angles. That's what he'd probably say, and that's what he said. And maybe he'd ask his followers who have little differences to have patience with each other. Maybe by making sure that, uh, that the converts don't have to go through crazy, drastic changes. If you keep reading past where Paula read, he might address egalitarianism by taking on the question of shared responsibility and shared relationships between men and women. Which, if you've ever read that or heard people talk about it, the Christian misogynists these days who tell women to stay in the kitchen have flipped that story completely on its head, and they read that story completely out of context, and those buffoons would have not lasted one day in Ephesus, and they don't deserve to last a day more in our capitals either. When I walk through this city knowing that Ephesus is the model of the struggles of being together in a diverse community, they had moderated success. They didn't figure it out and just have it all at once. It took constant work and reminding. It took crafting space for a diverse unity or a unified diversity or some kind of harmonious just struggle toward this. Making space for that harmony, it's not easy then, it's not easy now. But it is holy to see our uniqueness in our special gifts, our special callings, and it is holy to bring those together for a purpose. I hope we can do more of that here as they tried to do there, and I pray that this church can remember what Ephesus and the Ephesians were told, to be full of love for one another. Amen. Amen. invite you all to stand if you are able and join us in our song. I don't know if you saw the notes on the side, but um, the first verse can be sung by men or anyone. The second verse uh, can be sung by women or anyone. And the third verse is everybody for sure. So. <laughs>
So uh, thanks to all the folks. It took a lot of volunteers to handle the garage sale. Congratulations for that. We don't know the total that we raised, but all that money will go toward mission partners. Since we wrapped that all up, uh, today after service, we have a lunch for new faces around here. We'll get people to ask questions about the church and tell a little bit about where this congregation starts. And then on Wednesday, it's summertime, so we are doing our uh, summer Bible study. It's Wednesdays at 2 p.m. here, or we have a Zoom link on that. Uh, we're not going to have any archaeology because we're going way back in the Hebrew Bible where no one knows you know, what's mixed between history and everything else. But we're going to learn about Abraham's really messy family. If you think you have a messy family, just come and, and moderate and see, uh, see how well, uh, well he managed. So friends, if this family of faith has ever helped you in any way, or if you think we can be a source of support for our neighbors in our neighborhood, we always invite you to make an offering in the basket or online. We thank you for that, and we thank God for leveraging that for good. of the rainbow, all the voices of the wind, every dream that reaches out, reaches out to find where love begins, every word of every story, every star. In the spirit of prayer, gracious God, you planted the first garden and set within it the tree of life. Your life, your grace began and is irrepressible. You transform our brokenness into your salvation. We lift up to tell your love to all those who are victims of gun violence and all who are working to prevent it. We especially pray for those churches and communities that are transforming weapons of death into instruments of life. We give thanks for the Guns to Gardens event this week 
and we call on your creative power to inspire us further. We ask your blessing on those who search for hope. We ask your healing on those who suffer in grief. We give thanks for those who take steps of healing in all ways. And for all those who need healing, we bring them to you. For Judy's brother, Eddie, and their family. For Cheryl, recovering from her foot surgery. For Sue, recovering after a hospital stay. For Nancy's friend, Terry, with an eye injury. All those names in our hearts, we pray for them, and we pray this together and with all creation through the words you taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage.